Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this episode, we're exploring Wakayama City, visiting Wakayama Castle and its vast surrounding park. We stop into a famous ramen joint for an outstanding bowl of ramen before continuing our exploration, finding a beautiful temple and learning more about the history of the castle at its museum. We end a jam-packed day with a night of Japanese barbecued meat. Before we get into it, please do us a favor and give the video a like. And if you're new here, hit that subscribe button and the little notification bell so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's go. Good morning. Good morning. It's Monday morning. One time you don't mind a Monday morning no. <laughs> when you're on vacation. And we have four more full days here in Japan. We are heading to our hotel at the Narita Airport on Friday. So we have four precious days left and we are exploring a new area of Japan we haven't explored before. And this is Wakayama Prefecture. We've only been to Koyasan in Wakayama. Um, but other than that, this is all new territory for us and we're in Wakayama City now and we have a full day to explore it. Right now we are enjoying the hotel breakfast and one of the fun things that we like about staying at a hotel is that every morning we get a different breakfast when you switch hotel to hotel. And sometimes some breakfasts are better than others, some um, breakfast areas are nicer than others but it's fun to sample everything. But this time we scored big time because this place has a view like like no other. Mm. Yeah, there's floor to ceiling windows looking up at the castle. So I'm sitting here enjoying my breakfast, just admiring the castle. It's like a panoramic view, it right? Is. With blue skies yeah, and, and it's clear. And all the park in front of the castle. It's a really picturesque view. And notice that they've opened up the castle. It's getting close to nine o'clock and that's when the castle opens and all the windows and the doors on the top have been opened and they're ready for visitors. It's and glorious. we're gonna we're going to be two of them. Ooh. So let's finish up breakfast and get out there and explore Wakayama City. lovely day super sunny nice bright skies there's a wind today so yeah. it's nice and cool breeze coming through and that's great because we are back at the castle grounds making our ascent up the winding path towards the castle we're seeing so many things yeah. now that we did not see yesterday while clambering up in the dark yeah <laughs> I enjoyed going up in the yes. dark because I like seeing the castle at night the yeah. way it was lit up. I generally like buildings at night better if they're lit up well versus during the day. I uh, like the slight spookiness of it all. Oh, you like the spookiness? Like the spookiness. This was not as spooky as no. uh, Mount Bison yesterday yeah, or two very, days ago. You were very spooky. That out. was very spooky. I was like, more! <laughs> Bring on the bats! There's a lot to see here that you miss during the night, obviously. Um, it's not super well lit at night. No. The castle is like a beacon yes. and we were drawn to it like moth to a flame yesterday but the actual grounds are it's pretty dark. dimly lit yeah. which did make for a nice stroll up at night but mm -hmm. I'm enjoying seeing all these things that were shrouded in darkness today. The surprise is a shrine that we walked right past and mm, no idea it existed. You didn't? I did see it yesterday I but I couldn't get like I tried to film it but oh. it was way too dark I couldn't get anything out. I completely out. missed it. But yeah it's really cute. The uh, red bibs are in full force here. So this is reminding me of the huffing and puffing that went on yesterday trying to get up this hill. And I can see it a lot more clearly now, the winding path going up. It is uh, a decent hike. But with difficult hikes up, there are usually rewards looking back down from the top. So we should be able to see some great views over Wakayama once we get up there. I was reading some of the literature we picked up yesterday at the little tourist info hut outside the train station and they were talking about how Wakayama Park which is this vast park around the castle basically the old castle grounds is a great place to come for cherry blossom viewing but unfortunately that's in spring and we're here in the fall but luckily something else very breathtaking happens in the fall and that is the changing of the leaves here in the park and we're starting to get glimpses of that uh, there's a lot of yellows from the 
entrance way that we came in from and a lot of trees are shedding their leaves already but there's one spot that looks like it's going to be red there's going to be a lot of red leaves and there's a very interesting thing we're going to go check out in that area so we'll be there soon so i don't know i haven't seen cherry blossoms i haven't witnessed that whole thing so maybe i shouldn't be saying this but i'm pretty happy to be seeing the the leaves i do love the fall leaves that's something that reminds me of home you know in Ontario when it turns fall in the right areas it's just a, a sea of fire like oranges and yellows and reds and and so maybe it reminds me of home a little bit but I'm happy to be here for the fall changing of the leaves come inside the first two things that kind of greet you at the door is a video which unfortunately is all in Japanese and doesn't seem to be subtitled so we'll probably take a pass on that but the other thing that's really interesting is an old wooden model showing the framing work that would happen in the castle when it was originally built, not in this current mode of this reconstruction. You get a really good glimpse of how many beams and how many pillars they had to use to hold up all the weight of this castle and build it up to the height that it is. Uh, really interesting to kind of set the stage for what you're about to go and walk through. Before we go up to the top of the keep, we're gonna go around the perimeter. You can walk through the hallways that connect the various watchtowers up here in the main compound of the castle. And in the hallways, there are pictures lining one side of all the different castles in Japan. And the other side has some artifacts and whatnot that you can check out. But be warned in here so far, we haven't really seen any English. So we're not quite sure what all the things are that they've put on display, but all the pictures of the castles and trying to pick out which ones that we visited is a lot of fun, but there's not a ton to see other than some more different views from these hallways. Right above where we were in the entrance is a second story. And this is the, what they call the small keep. And this is a two story structure sitting right beside the main keep, which is multiple levels high uh, and there's not too much to see up on this second story it's pretty a small space i'm not quite sure what they would have used it for back in the day but right now they have some wooden models of some of the structures that make up the castle grounds around us some are still standing some are not uh, so we're going to move on to the main keep the big keep and see what the exhibit has in store for us there is the, technically the second floor of the main tower there's an exhibit which centers around samurai and if you like me love samurai culture and samurai history then you would really appreciate some of the pieces that they have in here they have some full samurai armor on display with the helmets and the face masks and they have a bunch of samurai swords on display and there's a lot of artifacts here that wouldn't necessarily think about when i'm thinking about samurai and it's interesting to see like and there's a few examples of undercoats that samurai would wear under their armor there's some examples of protective neck pieces and face pieces that uh, would be making up the helmet and what else they have a lot of spears in here a lot of weapons that, that they would use to uh, take down their enemies. That's a really great exhibit on samurai gear. 
In the 1600s, they used to hold an archery contest here and it would start at 6 p.m. and go until sunset the following day. And they would just be shooting arrows nonstop. A record was set in 1669. Uh, the archer hit 8,000 of 10,542 shots. Like that's insane. And it took 13 years for someone to beat that record. Uh, it, the new record was 8,133 hit shots out of 13,053. <laughs> the guy who got the new record, he was shooting nine arrows per minute, night and day. Uh, that's incredible. They have two example bows that would have been used during these competitions on display here. It's a nice tie-in to the little story that I read. The next level up from the one with all the samurai artifacts is a floor that seems to be dedicated to artifacts of the feudal lords themselves. There's some interesting things here like a, uh, a sword where the sheath has the Kyushu Togugawa family crest on it. And there's an under armor coat with the crest on it. And there's also a bunch of artifacts that they found as they excavated around the site when they were doing their reconstruction. Really interesting stuff to come check out. Another exhibit has various remnants of the old castle found during excavations of the castle grounds. There are examples of roof tiles and various adornments, including these cool Shachi Hoko, the protectors of the castle. We've stormed the keep. <laughs> we were successful. Yes, we're at the top of the castle tower now. And as we were predicting down below, the views are spectacular. Not only are we elevated in the tower, but we're also up on the hill. So that you can get a really good view over Wakayama city from up here, which is why they built the castle here. You can see out very, very far. And that was one of the features of this castle. This is one of the th top three main plain castles. And by plain, I mean like land, you know, like level land, flat land leading up to the hill here. You can see very far in all directions. Oh, I didn't know about that mm, plain land castle. Yeah. Uh, the, another one of the top three is uh, Himiji. Oh, yes. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting because you can see like way out to the other mountains around us. So there's the zone of uh, vulnerability for anyone coming to try and attack the castle or its town. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you like the most about this castle? Hmm. And what do you like the least? Uh, this castle is very picturesque. Like when we were walking outside before we went in, just every angle just seemed yeah. like a great picture. And yeah. it took us forever to get in because I took every one of those pictures. <laughs> Uh, it's really beautiful. What are your favorite features of this castle? The exterior is where this castle shines. Mm. The tile work and just the roof lines. I love the animal, fish animals. But mm. the inside is probably where it is its weakness. There's no wooden floors. It's just linoleum floors. Mm. It's kind of sterile, mm -hmm. um, very plain. I think the fluorescent lighting. So the inside is a bit but there are some museum bits, so that part was interesting. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of things to see and learn about here inside. So we've been very fortunate on yeah. this trip to show you three original castles that were dating back to some of their original roots. Like Hochi Castle was the only castle that actually still remained from the 1700s. The other ones were still like Matsuyama Castle yeah. and Ozu Castle were still like relics of the time. Yeah. And when they were reconstructed, they were reconstructed in the old methods. Uh, so we got a good glimpse at yeah. how it used to look like and you'd have to take your shoes off because everything was wood and all of that. And then we, at uh, those castles, we kept talking about concrete reconstructions and that's what this is. This castle was unfortunately uh, burnt down in the 1800s, I think. Yeah. And then it would have been rebuilt more in the old way, in the old style. But then it got completely demolished in World War II during air raids. Uh, and so they rebuilt it in the 50s as a concrete castle. And so that's why the inside is what you just described. It's like a modern building. It doesn't have that same old feel as the other three castles we shared with you on our previous videos. So you got a good idea of what both kind of look like. I mean, the advantage of this is we don't have to take our shoes off. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, I don't mind taking my shoes off is if it means touring an old school yeah. castle. But it's definitely just a different experience. Yeah. One is once you get inside, it's still very atmospheric. Mm -hmm. But this one, it does kind of, the personality is stripped away mm -hmm. a bit. Yeah, for sure. 
but there are some opportunities for learning here. We're gonna go outside and enjoy the views a bit more. This one, you can get out onto the balcony and go all the way around the castle tower, which is really neat. There's a neat diorama here that I wanna show you of how this castle and the grounds around it would have looked back in the day. And uh, then we're gonna go on to our next site. We hope you enjoyed exploring Wakayama Castle with us. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Even though it was a concrete reconstruction, the outside is spectacular. The exhibit inside is pretty good. The English is eh, hit or miss a little bit, um, but there's some interesting artifacts to see in there from the castle itself and also the samurai stuff that I was talking about earlier. So I would say this was a great visit. I, I would recommend it. Two thumbs up. Yeah. I think that it's really great that Japan makes all these castles so accessible in terms of entrance fee. Mm. It was like 400, 500 yen to get in. 410. 410. So about five, six bucks to come in, which is like each. Each. Yeah. So which is really, really reasonable. Is, it is really reasonable. I agree. And I do like that they reconstruct them yeah. like you were mentioning that it's like the it's part of the history yeah. here so letting like even though it, it's gone through some hard times and the war kind of devastated it i like that they do rebuild them so that they can maintain some of that heritage and you can come and learn about it uh, so we've been here for quite a while and we're going to move on to our next spot outside the castle where the ticket office is is a hut and we saw this hut last night, but it just looked like a sitting area with a few vending machines. And somehow today it has sprung into a gift shop and a little restaurant. So if you come up here and you're hungry, you can get some noodles, it looks like maybe some curry rice, and you can buy some souvenirs about uh, Wakayama. We've made it down from the castle and we're starting to explore the castle grounds and the park around the castle. And we've come to a shrine and this is the Wakayama Prefectural Gokoku Shrine. And we don't know much about it, but we're just gonna give you uh, some views of what we're seeing as we're strolling around. I wonder if it's a coincidence that the castle that we went to is made out of concrete and the shrine right beside it or right below it is also made of concrete. Probably not a coincidence. If the castle was destroyed by bombings and most of the buildings in this area, if this shrine existed then, it also would have been destroyed. So it's interesting that they've mixed concrete and wood in this shrine. Uh, inside there's the shrine itself, which is all built in wood, and it's kind of protected in this huge concrete casing. And I wonder if they did it on purpose to protect it from future disasters. We've made it to a spot in the park that I alluded to earlier. Remember talking about the fall colors and being able to get some of the reds? Well, this is Ohashi Roka Bridge. It's a covered bridge and I don't think I remember seeing any long covered bridge like this before in Japan. No, this is very unique, a very unique bridge, not only in construction in that way, but also because it's a weird diagonal kind of angle that they had to build it. Do you remember why they built such a bridge? I do remember. Oh. This was to allow the feudal lord, his retainers, and his women in waiting to be able to go from one section of the compound to another section of the compound. And it was covered and 
completely encased to prevent people from seeing what was moving back and forth. So they wanted to keep their ongoings private. Yes. I guess if they had to move the Lord around in uh, tumultuous times, no one would know exactly where he was. Or mm -hmm. if certain retainers could give hints as to what was going on, if they were seen moving around, you know, and women in waiting, I can only assume what those meant. <laughs> So yeah, basically they didn't want people spying on certain movements that could give them clues as to what was happening here in the castle. And it was also used as a shortcut too, right? So instead of going all the way around the compound. Yeah, I mean these people could have gotten from one section to the other, but they would have had to go through a longer route and also a more public route. Mm. Yeah, they would have been seen crossing the official bridges that were guarded uh, by pretty much anybody, I guess. This one was probably guarded by trusted guards of the uh, the Lord oh. yeah so it's a really nice spot let's give you a look around There was something about this bridge that was not advertised. Are you talking about the pain shooting up your feet? Yes, yes, yes I am. Yes, that's because of the ridges in the floor. And those were put there because this bridge was built diagonally. And when I said that earlier, I didn't mean like diagonally across this way. I meant more vertically because one side of the moat was higher than the other and they had to join those two sides. They had to build this bridge on a slant. And to prevent you from sliding down the bridge, because you can imagine if it was wood, it would start to get very slippery as it started to get polished. They took the boards and instead of lining them up perfectly, the floorboards, they overlapped them a little bit. And that gave you this little ridge here that your feet could hook into and prevent you from sliding all the way down. And that is what's causing the pain in our feet, especially since we didn't realize that. We started marching across the bridge and we're like, what's going on? Why, does it, why are our feet hurting? Is because of that ridging that they had to do and this is a reconstruction this bridge was rebuilt in 2006 uh, to the original kind of specs of the first bridge that was built that we were talking about earlier that allowed passage secret passage back and forth between these two sections of the castle compound so I'm gonna get out of here so my feet can get some relief <laughs> As you stroll the park, you'll find these informational signs giving you details about what the area in front of you would have looked like back in the glory days of the castle and its grounds. Do you have any stone factoids for me about Wakayama Castle? <laughs> I actually do have some stone <laughs> factoids for you. Uh, there's three different styles that they use to build the walls here on the compound. And you can see them as you're walking through the park uh, at various points and they are of differing structural soundness. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> maybe the best way to say that. There's one style where they just took a lot of, they just took stones and they kind of piled them on top of each other and then they filled in the gaps with dirt and smaller stones. Mm -hmm. So and, like rough stones. Yeah, like really rough. And that's the walls that you see have a, quite a slant to them. Mm -hmm. They have a bit of a slope and that's because they will crumble if they are built too steeply. Mm -hmm. And then the second style is similar to that style, except they do a little bit more work in trying to shape the stones so they fit together a bit better. And then they still fill in all the gaps with earth and smaller stones. Mm -hmm. And those can be a little bit steeper. And then the third style, which is the most impressive because it must have been the most amount of work yeah. is the ones where they perfectly cut the stones to fit each other and they don't have to fill the gaps with anything yeah so they would use stone masons to construct these parts of the wall yeah and those ones really stick out because they can be almost completely vertical they don't need to have any slant to them and these would be usually used for load bearing walls so mm -hmm. the base of a castle or a structure on top they'd have to use this style because it would be the most sound and it, would, it wouldn't have the chance of falling over like the other other yeah. versions would. You don't would. want to build your foundation on a crumbly wall. No, you don't want crumbly foundations, that's true. So we are going to be leaving the park now. Yes. We've walked around through the park quite a bit. We visited the castle, we've gone through the bridge, we've gone through some gardens, and now it's time to find some lunch. <music> Mm. 
we've made a bit of a pilgrimage today. We've walked about 25 minutes from our hotel in the castle to come to a ramen shop that has won awards in Japan. It's been voted consistently one of Japan's favorite ramens. Um, it's credited for bringing ramen popularity to Wakayama. Yeah. Totally. And it's been used by the tourism board here as a draw to get people to yeah. come to Wakayama. They're the main feature. If you look at the poster behind me for Wakayama, mm -hmm. they're, um, they're front the and center. Front and center, exactly. Yeah. And there's lots of signed notes up here around the shop showing all the people who have come and enjoyed the ramen. And we've come at a very strategic time. We're here on a Monday at 3 p.m right in the middle of dinner and lunch. And we were hoping it wouldn't be too busy because it's apparently famous for long queues, yeah. people waiting to get in here at least, at least and get their ramen. An yeah. So that has panned out because we're sitting and we didn't have to wait. But there has been a constant flow of people coming and going ever since we sat down and ordered. We are gonna show you our ramen when it comes. We've both ordered basically the same bowl mm -hmm. and we've got eggs and I'm really excited. There are two things really notable about the ramen that this little shop is pumping out. One is the broth. And it's like many ramen shops, many ramen's pork-based broth. It's a 14-hour boiled pork bone that creates this really thick and tasty tonkatsu broth. But they've spiked it with something, and that's what makes it special. It's spiked with soy sauce, and that heightens the flavor of the pork and the richness, gives it a saltiness and a deepness that you won't find in most ramens. Mmm. That lives up to the hype. Get that mouthfeel of like a really rich pork, pork broth, but then the soy sauce just changes the game completely. And it is, the saltiness is really adds a lot to the, to the pork. It's also that fermented flavor of the soy sauce that comes through. It's kind of like an aftertaste, you get that soy sauce flavor. Mm. The other thing about this ramen at the shop is the noodles. They use a thinner, straight noodle, as opposed to the more traditional, a little bit broader um, ramen noodle. That noodle's really good. It's cooked perfectly as you would expect, it has a good chewiness, but the thinness does make it stand out. It has a totally different feel in the mouth. It's still really, is good at bringing that soup base up with it and then coating your mouth with that broth, but it just has a totally different vibe than most ramens. I'm very happy we made the walk out here. Uh, we also got eggs. Let's check in with Nicole and see what she thinks of the egg. I like it when you get a really hot dish and then some element of the dish is cold. And this is what happened here. Got a very hot bowl of ramen and then they gave me a nice cold egg and I feel like it somehow just like revives my mouth. Mm. And the egg here, I've already taken a bite and the egg is bang on. It's a soy sauce egg. The uh, white is really like flavored. The soy sauce got right in there and the yolk is not runny, but it's creamy. It's solid mm. and creamy. It's like biting into a stick of butter. Hmm. And we know how much I like <laughs> butter. You're getting me excited for my egg. Yeah. Mmm. Yeah, a really good egg. Just even the white part of the egg is super tasty because of all the um, soy sauce that's really marinated and penetrated through. Mm, you can see the color, like yeah. how deep the color goes. Amazing. My tummy is so happy. I really think that this place's fame was justified. Yeah, that was a very good bowl of ramen and the broth really did stand yeah. out. I've never tasted anything quite like that before. The soy sauce was so like, it's not like they poured soy sauce into the broth. It was somehow like cooked into the it broth. It was infused yeah, into that that's broth. Infused. And I love the aftertaste you got from the broth, yeah. which was kind of like that fermented soy sauce flavor. Uh -huh. It was really good. And we licked our balls. We pretty much did, yes. And the service was really good. Yeah. It was like family service. They were so warm and mm. just such nice people. Yeah, it's still a family run joint. Yeah. And you got a souvenir. I got a box of it to take home. It won't be the same, but it'll be something for me to remember this good experience by. 
On our mad dash to our ramen joint, we passed by lots of beautiful spots that we did not look at. But on the way back, now that we're full, check out what we found. Yes, yeah, this amazing temple sandwiched between all these buildings around it. There's a big hall, a bell tower, a beautiful gate leading in, and a little bit of a cemetery. It all really compressed and crammed yeah. into this little space. I like the food dogs that are on the top of the roof mm, tiles. Yeah, they're really cool. Just a quick stop to give you a peek. We've been walking back from the ramen restaurant to the hotel because we want to drop off those noodles, Nicole bought before we go to our next spot. And uh, we went a long way back because I wanted to stop by one of the gates of the castle grounds. And this was originally the main entrance into the castle compound. It was moved a little bit later when a new lord took possession. He moved it to the one next to our hotel. But this is still a very important spot in the castle grounds because this is one of very few structures that still remain from the 1700s. Uh, most of the other stuff, as we mentioned earlier, was destroyed in the bombings. So I find it really interesting to come and see it because it is so old. Uh, I'm not sure how much of it is still from those days. I mean, they've been probably repairing it and fixing it over the years because it is made of wood after all. But it's still really interesting that this was the one kind of surviving corner of the compound uh, after World War II. And this gate is interesting and notable because it's two stories. And so soldiers would be stationed up on the top story and be able to have a good lookout for enemies coming and have an advantage to attack them from above. And the gate itself is not overly thick, really. That's the width of the, the door. This is the walls, and then the doors would close into this. So this is not cr crazy thick as we've seen in other places where it be wouldn't fit in this shot. The, the structures would be super, super thick. It's well supported, though, by these additional beams at the back. So if anybody came and tried to ram down this gate, the, the front of the gate, they'd still have a hard time because it's reinforced from the backside. Yeah, really neat. We made it back to the hotel just in time. It was sort of spitting on us. It's supposed to rain really heavily tonight be done in time for our departure tomorrow, but it seems to have come a little bit earlier than originally expected, and we might get a little bit wet this evening. But as we were walking back from the ramen restaurant, it was constantly just a little drops coming down, warning us that it was about to let loose. And as we got up to our room, it did sort of let loose for a little bit, but it looks like it has stopped, which is good because we are going to an indoor attraction for the rest of the afternoon. And it is that building right over there. So we just have to walk a little distance before we're safe inside. And that is the History Museum. So let's get over there before it really starts to rain again. We've just finished touring around the History Museum. And it's just a small little museum with history about the castle itself and the castle grounds. And there are some really interesting things in there, but 
Nicole's got um, something got really this. interesting right now. So we're down in the gift shop. So it is a very small museum. It's included in the price of the castle admission. So if you want to come check it out and you're here, definitely do that. You were actually the museum's divided into two and you were interested in one half and I was interested in the second half. Yeah, I was interested in the castle half and you're interested in the, how do they phrase it? Notable people of Wakayama. Yes. And one of the notable people people here started Panasonic. Yeah. Whoa, that's quite a feat. That is, it's amazing. And they had a lot of black and white photos. So if you are into black and white photos, of, I think it started from like early like 1900s to like the 1960s to see, uh, get a glimpse of what life was like mm. in Wakayama. That, that's, that's the exhibit for you. Yeah, and the cool thing they had at the Castle Museum was the gold seal mm. of like the 10th Lord of this area. Um, which goes must go back to like late 1600s, early 1700s, and it has this really cool three-piece seal, one like a cube, which had six different seals on it, and that fit into uh, like a little holder, which had a seal on it, and it was a, a lion cub, and that would sit into a bigger piece, which was an actual lion. Yeah, so it was kind of nested like seals, and it's been around for hundreds of years. Yeah, it was amazing. So back to Wakayama, in case you think that we've just abandoned our Wakayama theme, we have not because Wakayama is famous for ginger. Ginger ice cream. <laughs> and what did you get? Ginger ale ice cream. <laughs> They're also like famous for ginger ale. They make ginger ale. They're trying to step on Canada's toes there a little <gasps> bit. Canada dry. Yeah. Watch out! Yeah. <laughs> but this ice cream is fantastic. It's it came from one of those puck mm. that they have. Um, it's not super super creamy, but it has a good ginger bite. And when you lick and you go through the ice cream, there's little bits of candy ginger. Mm, I love that. Is that a tint? Mm. Mm. That is really good. I'm hoping that I find this in other parts of Japan, but then it occurred to me that I'm leaving. So even if I even if they did sell this in other parts of Japan. None for me. No. All right, so we're done here at the museum and the little gift shop. It's in a small building, relatively small building, on the castle grounds. It's a three-story building, and interestingly enough, the third floor has the committee or the organization that looks after the castle. And uh, yeah, so it's all here on one building. We are going to scurry back to the hotel. It's now raining pretty good out there, and figure out what we're going to do for dinner. other videos you know that I am a meat lover pure carnivore so when we were dragging our luggage and I looked up and I saw meat meat I had ideas instantly we double checked online and it has really good reviews and voila here we are did you think we'd be coming to meet Meat when you saw it on our uh, yeah I was gonna say something that made it sound like a week ago but it was yesterday yeah Oh my God, yes. It was yesterday. Just yesterday that I saw Meat Meat. Yeah, and now you're here. Wow, no, I did not think that, I was hoping it was going to happen, but I did not know it was going to happen. Mm. Yeah, so we finally peeled ourselves out of our hotel room. I guess we were there for an hour and a half. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. about an hour and a half. It rained pretty hard while we were in there, and it kind of has calmed down, so That's hopefully... That's what we were doing. We were avoiding the rain. There we you weren't go. being lazy. There you go. <laughs> and then we started hunting for a place to eat, and this one came up, yeah. and then it was a coincidence. It's so, also very close to the hotel, yeah. another selling point. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. we're here, we've ordered. Yeah, it's a cute little place. It is very cute. There's like three stations in this floor. It seems like they might have a second story, but I, we're not sure. So we're sat at a like, kind of like a bar seating with a grill and a cool pipe coming down to suck up all our fumes. And I'm starving, so you I'm know, really looking forward to the meat. You coming. know what vibe I'm getting from here? What? It's like meat grill place meat meets hipster bar. Mm. Doesn't it feel like a hipster coffee joint in here? Kind of does. It's just slinging coffee, so just gonna sling meat yeah. at us. <laughs> well, the name itself is interesting. Yeah. Meat, meat, as in meat while you eat meat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the door is really cool because yeah. the door to an old freezer yeah. or an old fridge. Yeah. Um, 
Like a meat locker? Yeah, yeah. creative. They're, 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 they're using their noggins. All right, so food should be here soon, hopefully, and uh, we'll start grilling it up and showing you. We got a pretty good selection for our first round. We got a plate that has chicken, sausages, and pork. And then we got a set which came with a beer, which I'm enjoying right now. Some nice looking beef and some edamame. And then we also got a plate of really thinly cut tongue. And so far we've put some chicken, pork, and sausages on the grill. And I am gonna try some chicken. I've also made up a set of sauces. And there's pepper and salt, freshly ground. There's something we think is like a barbecue sauce. And then they have fresh garlic, like <coughs> pureed garlic. I put some of that in there. And then a sesame based sauce. I'm gonna try the sesame with the chicken. meats. You can't go wrong with grilled meats. It's nice and soft and really tender. I think this is dark meat. It's juicy. So far so good. That chicken was amazing. I inhaled it. I've moved on to the sausage and so far sausages in Japan have been good but haven't been blown away by them until now. These ones have an incredible snap to it. The skin has such a good snap, and when you bite into it, the chicken is kind of solid. Not a um, mushy, not a mushy um, processed taste. Like it feels like it's made with like solid, good chicken. It is really good. Now, chicken sausage. I think we need another round of chicken sausage for sure. Next up is the fatty pork. I think it's jowl meat um, with a good amount of fat on it. And I like to overcook this. Maybe it's improper of me, but I like to get the fat really rendered and crispy. And then I like this one with salt. So I'm dipping this in salt. Mm. I love it when the fat has a bit of a crunch to it. And this is not thin like a bacon at home. So it's still juicy inside, but the exterior has gotten crunchy. Good porky flavor and that salt, as it does with most foods, really accentuates the pork flavor. Mmm, crunchy fat. It's so good. I'm really enjoying myself so far. We've hit four types of meat, now we've moved on to the cow tongue. And I'm just so happy with this meal so far. I like that we got a variety of uh, meats to try and cow tongue is one of my favorites. So I have high hopes coming up. The big moment has come. My beef tongue is finally ready. I've covered it in the sweet sauce that they've had and mixed some minced garlic on top. Mmm. Mmm. The sweet, the sweet and the garlic go so well with the beef. It just melts together perfectly. The tongue is chewy, but in a really good chewy way. Every time I chew, I want to chew more to get the flavor out. Really delicious. I agree with Nicole, the beef tongue is really good. And it's different than the beef tongue we have been eating on this trip so far. Usually when we're going out to beef tongue, we go to a beef tongue restaurant and they do a thicker cut of tongue and they score it in a way that it's not as chewy as this is. So this is a bit chewier, but it's not rubbery. It breaks apart easily, but just not quite as easy as the thicker pieces that are scored. So it has a completely different feel than the other beef tongue we've been having, but this is also really good and it's really juicy. Okay, the moment is here. We saved the best for the last. This is the beef rib. 
since the beef tongue paste is so good with the um, sweet and garlic sauce, I am going for a repeat. Wow. You didn't tell me it was this good when you had it. Oh my mm. god. It is fantastic. The beef is so it's thickly cut. When you bite into it, it's very, very juicy. It's chewy, but not, again, not a bad chewy. Just You just want to keep biting and get more and more flavor out of it. Wow, this piece is fantastic. I don't think it even needs the sauce. It's good with the salt. Yeah, Nicole, I was too busy shoving that beef in my mouth to mention anything to you. It was really good. Um, I cooked mine, as usual, a little bit more because I wanted to render some of that fat out. And every bite was really juicy. And again, just pepper and salt was the magic combo to make the flavors really shine from that beef. I think we're going to have to order another one of those. So we're on to plate number two of this amazing beef. And look at this. Look at how juicy that is. That's all beef fat just kind of rendering out of this meat. Again, I've just dipped it in pepper and salt. Mm. Every bit of this meat, the fat is the kind that just melts in your mouth. It's not any like tough or sinewy type of fat. It's just melting. Every bite is juicy and melts and it's super easy to eat. I love that. It's so good. We've been to a number of meat barbecue restaurants in Japan because quite frankly, we love them. <laughs> and I don't think that we haven't had one that wasn't extremely, extremely good. Yeah, everyone has been stellar. But this one... It blows them out of the water for yeah. sure. Yeah, this was amazing. I don't know what it was about. I'm trying to rack my brain to think what is it about this place that blows the other places out of the water. And I'm having a hard time. I think that the quality was really, really good. Mm -hmm. The presentation was good. And we got a variety. Could be that, yeah. I mean, it must be that. What else could it be? I mean, the cooking apparatus is pretty standard. It's yeah. a flame. The seasoning is very simple. It's just some salt and pepper and green onion on top. Mm -hmm. A few dishes had like some kind of marinade, but I doubt that that's what's making it. Yeah, it must just be the quality of the ingredients at this place. Yeah. So, yeah, this place is really good. A link is down below in the description if you are ever here and want to meet check it out. Meat. Meet me. Meet. Yeah, <laughs> pretty easy to find. But yeah, so so good. Um, Such I don't, a success. I don't. Yeah, so I don't know satisfied. what. I don't know what else to say about it other than it was just. It just blew my mind. It was really that good. So we are going to uh, get the bill and get out of here. We're walking back now. It's still kind of raining, not too bad, but I just wanted to show you the canal that this restaurant backs onto. It was really nicely lit up, and the bridge even behind me is lit up. A really picturesque little spot. And they have a little deck out back with some fairy lights on it. And we saw on Google in their pictures that if you, um, if it wasn't raining, we could probably have sat out there but tonight would have been a bit miserable. But you can sit out there and grill some meats out in the open air and enjoy the lit up canal. It would have been really nice, but really enjoyed sitting inside too because the decor in there was really kind of eclectic in a way, kind of all over the place, but had that hipster vibe, which is always kind of cool. We're just heading back to the hotel. It's pretty early, but don't really feel like walking around in the rain uh, tonight. We're just gonna go back and chill out pack up, get ready to leave tomorrow, on to our next spot, which should be interesting. Looking forward to sharing that with you tomorrow, and I'll never get tired of this view. It's so cool to have a site like that in town. I'm just kind of walking back from dinner, and you just look up and you see this amazing castle. And uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, I was commenting, I wonder if the locals get used to this kind of thing, and they just sort of start to take it for granted. But we learned at that little museum tonight that it was actually the locals here in Wakayama that got it reconstructed in the 50s. Uh, it doesn't sound like they were going to do it, but then a lot of the locals banded together and convinced the authorities, whoever those would have been, to do it, to reconstruct the castle and bring it back to the community. So it probably does play an important role in the community's identity here in the city of Wakayama. Uh, something that they were very proud of and they should be. It's really cool. Uh, so as I said, we're heading back to the hotel and probably going to crash. Feeling pretty tired. 
and want to get ready for tomorrow. So we'll catch you later. Before we go, I wanted to say good night. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed exploring Wakayama City with us, make sure to let us know by giving the video a like down below. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the little notification bell so you don't miss the next episode. We'll see you in the next one.